Hello, everyone. I'm David Haig with the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. And the title of this talk is Characterizing the Ambiguity Function of Constant Envelope OFDM Waveforms. This work was done in tandem with David Felton at the Radar Systems Lab in the University of Kansas. And this work was sponsored by the Office of Naval Research. Just a quick outline, I'll provide a motivation for pursuing this work. Then I'll get into the constant envelope or CE OFDM waveform signal model. Then I'll present some closed form results characterizing the CE OFDM waveform's ambiguity function shape, talk about the implications for CE OFDM waveform design, and finally I'll conclude. Now, the primary motivation for this work is that CE OFDM waveforms are gaining increasing interest for use in dual function radar communications applications. And specifically on the radar side, the, the communication symbols you encode into the waveform could be used as a discrete set of parameters that you that, that synthesize waveforms with desirable properties, for example, a desirable ambiguity function shape. Now, there have been some efforts in the literature that have pursued these ideas, but to the best of our knowledge, the properties of the CEOFDM waveform's ambiguity function has not been fully mathematically characterized. And so therefore, we set about trying to do just that. Right, so that's conceptually what we're interested in. Here's the mathematical model. So our waveform will be a standard FM type waveform model. We have a complex exponential, even J5t, 5t is the instantaneous phase. Uh, the root over t, which is our, our waveform pulse length, just normalizes the waveform to unit energy. The modulation function is uh, the first time derivative of the phase divided by two pi, and it maps the instantaneous frequency as a function of time. Will largely be interested in the ambiguity function, which correlates the waveform with its Doppler shifted versions. Here, the Doppler shift mu is given by this relation to the right. R dot is the target range rate, C is the speed of light through the medium, and FC is some carrier frequency, whether it's X band or S band or some other band you wish to operate. We'll also look at the zero Doppler cut of the ambiguity function or the auto correlation function. Now, there are a series of metrics that describe the, the, the main lobe and side lobe structure of the ambiguity function. So let's take a look at the main lobe first. So if I perform a second order Taylor series expansion about the origin, and then take some constant level contour cut across that main lobe, I will always trace out an ellipse. And here's the equation for that ellipse down below. So the width of the major axis is inversely proportional to this thing called the armus bandit measure of the spread about the, of, of the waveform spectra about its carrier frequency. The minor axis width is inversely proportional to the RMS pulse length, which determines Doppler resolution. And the degree of coupling rho is known as the range Doppler coupling factor, and that's going to determine whether or not the waveform is Doppler sensitive or Doppler tolerant. Now, it turns out you can calculate these ellipse of ambiguity or EOA parameters in exact close form, and I show the equations for them here. So the RMS pulse length is just a function of the complex envelope, and this is a very simple calculation. This is a standard result in literature. The RMS bandwidth and coupling factor are, are functions of the first time derivative of the phase or the modulation function. So if you know the modulation function in closed form, you can calculate these parameters in closed form. Moreover, if you have a modulation function that's composed of a set of uh, discrete parameters that you can modify, you can even shape those EOA parameters and therefore shape the ambiguity functions mainly. Now let's talk about the side lobes a little bit. Now I'm showing the autocorrelation function just for illustrative purposes, but these metrics directly apply to the ambiguity function as well. So the simplest one is perhaps the peak to side lobe level ratio or PSLR, and it's the ratio of the, the, the tallest side lobe to the uh, height of the, the main lobe peak. Right? And since this is, uh, this is zero dB, it's a pretty easy calculation, right? This is useful for distinguishing weak quick targets in the presence of a much stronger one. Now, if your target type is a continuum of scatterers, you may be interested in something like the integrated side lobe level, or ISL. Now, this is the ratio of the area under the side lobe region, I'm denoting by A sub tau, divided by the area under the main lobe region, A not. Right, so generally, a lower ISL translates to lower area under the side lobe region, so lower side lobes, in exchange for, at times, a wide name of the main lobe. So it's the same sort of trade-off that we experience in spectral analysis, except now we're applying it to the autocorrelation function. Uh, another set of functions that will be important for this discussion, and I go over them in more detail in the paper, are these things called generalized vessel functions, or GBS for short. 
So to understand what these things are, let me start with the standard cylindrical vessel function. So this, the vessel function has this well-known generating function given here. And if we let Q lie on the unit circle, we get the following Jacobi anger expansion for vessel functions. This is essentially saying that this function, e to the j sine of theta, is expressed as a complex Fourier series where the best the nth order vessel function with argument z are the Fourier coefficients. And so for a multidimensional generalization of the vessel function, we have the following, following generating function given below here. So the only difference now is we're using this, this L-dimensional um, generalized vessel function. Again, if we let Q lie on the unit circle, we're going to get the following more general Jacobi anger expansion for these GBS. And we're going to add one more wrinkle to the model and now use these L-dimensional L minus one parameter GBS. So this adds a few, a, a little bit of a complication to the generating function. So now there's not just this, this quantity Q, but now we have these gamma sub L's, there's L minus one of them. And if Q and gamma sub L take on these complicated phase terms, complex phase terms, uh, we can get a, uh, again, a even more general Jacobi anger expansion for these uh, L dimensional L minus one parameter GBS. And this is the form that we're going to use in our analysis of CBO All right, so that's the mathematical model. Let's talk about waveforms. So Sort of the inspiration for pursuing this work in the first place was the multi-tone sinusoidal FM waveform, a waveform model that I've been developing over the last several years. And uh, simply stated, its instantaneous phase is expressed as a finite Fourier series. And here, these coefficients, alpha and beta sub L, can be utilized as a discrete set of parameters that we can modify to synthesize waveforms with unique characteristics. Moreover, it's FM, so it has a nice smooth modulation function, which results in a nice compact spectral shape. Most of the waveform energy is concentrated in that swept band. And you can realize a variety of different ambiguity function shapes. And I detail uh, these properties in a paper for IEEE transactions on aerospace and electronic systems that came out about two years ago. Now, as it turns out, the CEOFDM waveform model is in fact a special case of the multi FM waveform. So let me show you that. So it's a standard CEO FDM waveform model. It essentially takes its instantaneous phase as a form of OFDM signal. Here, H is a modulation index, and C sub L R are communication symbols. Now, if I do a complex to real transformation of this Fourier series, I get the following representation. And this looks a lot like the multitonus FM waveform model in the previous slide, except now I'm scaling by some modulation index. Now, if I do one more uh, transformation to the magnitude phase representation of the Fourier series, I get the following relation here. So this, these are the magnitudes of those uh, symbols, and these are the phases of those symbols. And I, since we're using phase shift keying, the magnitude is going to lie in the unit circle somewhere, and we'll have some phase, some sort of phase associated with each, uh, um, each carrier. So in essence, the CDOFDM waveform using PSK is a very special case of the multi-tonus FM waveform, where those Fourier coefficients lie on the unit circle. So we can now leverage mathematical properties of the multiple SFM to describe the properties of the CEOFDM. And here's one of the things you can do with it. So you can represent the CEOFDM's uh, time series as that complex Fourier series with our harmonics, and then this um, sort of uh, GBF-based representation for the Fourier coefficients. Now, this is a very easy function to deal with when you go to try to solve for things like the spectrum and ambiguity function. And the derivations are given in the paper, but I just show the results here. So these are novel expressions that uh, are a little more compact than previous efforts that use product of sums of 1D vessel functions. Additionally, we can calculate the EOA parameters that characterize the main mode of the ambiguity function of this waveform uh, simply by knowing the modulation function for the CEO of the F. So I show that here. And if you plug into beta RMS in rho, as I show in the paper, you get the following expressions. So note, this is an exact post form for RMS bandwidth for any given modulation index, index pulse length, or number of carriers. And is in stark contrast to the, um, comp the, the approximation you may find in the literature that held only for a large modulation index. Additionally, that coupling factor is a function of the PSK sequence. So we may be able to control the degree of coupling in that ambiguity function angle. 
So here's an example waveform where we can apply some of the closed form expressions we just derived. So in this case, I'm using L equals 24 some carriers. The modulation index is chosen so that this waveform's RMS bandwidth is equal to that of an LFM whose time bandwidth product is 200. The uh, PSK symbols are randomly generated and they are m airy where m PSK is 32. And so you can see uh, the, the properties of this waveform down below. So again, nice smooth modulation function and correspondingly a nice compact spectral shape similar to an LFM. Now the pseudo random nature of the PSK sequence produces a thumbtack-like ambiguity function. And as it turns out, this is generally the only type of ambiguity function shape you'll get with CEOFDM waveforms using PSK. And let me talk about why that's the case. So, so um, I'm gonna define this normalized coupling factor rho tilde, which is just uh, normalized by the RMS pulse length and bandwidth respectively. And here's, your, here's the expression. This now takes on values between plus or minus one. Uh, where plus or minus one are either negatively or, or positively strongly coupled and, and things plus to zero are uncoupled. Uh, I then calculate what rho max, rho tilde max would be. And it turns out there's a very special sequence that gives you that maximum value. So um, the phases are pi for odd harmonics and zero for even harmonics. And so I'm plotting that below in the, in the uh, lower left uh, panel here. So it decays with increasing L. So we're getting a, an increasingly uncoupled main wave as we increase the number of uh, carriers in our, our waveform. And on the right, I'm showing the uh, ellipses, the EOA ellipses uh, for several waveforms, starting with a perfectly coupled ellipse, an LFM. Uh, and you can see it's a very coupled Doppler tolerant design. Next, I show the case for L equals one, which is roughly 0.78. It's got some coupling to it, but it's not nearly as coupled as something like an LFM. You may still consider this relatively doctor sensitive. Uh, for L equals 24, I get a value that's roughly 0.26. Right? And you can see that's not particularly coupled. In fact, it's not much different from a completely uncoupled main right here. As a reference, the waveform in the previous example had pseudo-random coefficients, and it was um, it had a, co uh, a coupling coefficient of 0.08. So even closer to that, that zero value. And generally speaking, that's what happens if you have pseudo-random uh, PSK sequences. They tend to cancel each other out in this expression. You get something very close to zero. So generally speaking, uh, a CEO of the MWA form employing PSK will essentially always possess a thumbtack like and beauty function shape. Now, what that means for the side lobes is that we're going to have a pedestal of side lobes that, that uh, is evenly distributed in the range doctor plane. The next thing we wanted to look at was, uh, are there any differences in the side load structure based on the, on the PSK sequence? So to demonstrate that, we pick a two carrier example that again has the same time bandwidth product as an L uh, of 200. Uh, and, and we chose H to uh, have that RMS bandwidth equal to that of an LFM for music comparison. We're gonna let those coefficients lie, lie in a continuum of values on the circle. So what I'm showing on the left is the uh, ISL metric, and on the right, the PSLR metric for these two uh, different phase values for our carriers. There's two things you'll notice. There are some local minima strewn about on, on both of these metrics. So you could, in theory, probe that these uh, surfaces with uh, some sort of optimization problem, sort of, sort of optimization algorithm that gives you a waveform with desirably low all the correlation function side loads. The other thing I'll point out is that there is some odd symmetry in, in just these two phase values. And this suggests that maybe there are special types of uh, PSK sequences that produce desirable low autocorrelation function properties in a manner similar to uh, sequence design for phase coded waveforms. So I would challenge those of you in the radar community who study that sort of thing to search for good sequences, PSK sequences, or or um, other types of, of sequences that will generate CDFDM waveforms with desirable autocorrelation function properties. Okay, so, so just to quickly conclude, we showed that the CEOFDM waveform is a special case of the multi-tonus FM waveform model. And from there, we're able to de uh, derive exact closed form expressions for the spectrum, the ambiguity function, and also the autocorrelation function of a CEOFDM waveform using uh, PSK sequences. Uh, we also got closed form expressions for the EOA parameters of the CEO of the M waveform and showed that it will essentially always achieve a thumbtack ambiguity function shape. 
that sort of formulates the sort of side load structures that we we'll expect. But even, even though they'll generally be thumbtacks, the choice of the PSK symbols does indeed impact the ACF side load structure in terms of getting slightly lower peak side loads. And that looks like a, a topic of future um, investigation, either through optimization routines that can get you those low side loads or through efficient code construction. So with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to giving this talk in front of all of you who are going to San, uh, San Antonio um, later on this spring. <laughs>